when the survival of the individual plays second fiddle to the survival of the species. Breeding becomes the predominant drive among our wildlife, and there's many a contest for the attention of females. I've seen a blue herring in the reservoirs around here. Is it normal for them to come once and not come again? Or because I haven't seen them yet? The great blue heron is pretty common in Massachusetts. What you might find with them is they, they nest in colonies, colonies called rookeries. Mm -hmm. And they nest in colonies called rookeries. What you might find with them is they nest in colonies called rookeries. Usually backwater beaver ponds where there's an old dead tree or two or five or six. We've had as many as 18 nests all in one general area. They fly out from there to their feeding ground. Uh, one of the things we're doing is when land like that becomes available, we know of a nesting colony, we might buy up that property and leave it there because the birds come back and nest year after year. They are migratory. Uh, you don't see them outside of the late fall until spring again. Well, if it's one year we saw there was two, then the following year it was only one, and this year there wasn't any. Was it a nest you're talking about? They were, it was off the side of the reservoir, as far back um, uh, an overflow section of the water. There is a lot of dead tree in the hiding places for them. <coughs> That's one of the things about wildlife management is, is knowing the species and what some of the requirements for that particular species are. And everyone is different. Even though that they're all living in the same general location in the outdoors, uh, they all have certain requirements. If you want to go back to our abstracts and laws here, I'd like to talk a little bit for a while about deer being our most common uh, large game animal. On the inside, you'll see a map here. It says deer management zone. Now, well, supposing you were given the task of developing some type of a management plan for the white tailed deer, and you ask yourself, where do you start? Our division provides uh, some of money to the University of Massachusetts for certain grad student work to be done on some of these research type programs. What they did here with the deer was to take a map of the Massachusetts and then start an overlay system. And each overlay had something different on it. Forest type covers for one. Population centers for another. Major road systems. Major waterways. Uh, what did I leave out here? I'm leaving out something. Of course, oh yes. Uh, Every known deer kill in the last 50 years, whether it be from a report system by the hunters or from road kills, dog kills, these kind of things. And when this thing was, was all put together, one on top of the other, it sort of uh, came out in this 3D effect here. And you can just about trace out the boundaries of where deer might live. So you can see off to the west what would be uh, the Berkshires, where zone one would start. 
and then they apply to that certain dopamines would allow a certain amount of dough to be taken, trying to maintain a balance of herd of the deer that live in that particular zone. Each zone again being different because uh, on some of the some of the places there are not as many deer as others. Uh, what I should mention right up front is that hunting itself is the best tool of management for the for the uh, white-tailed deer itself. I mean by that you can by regulating the, the, the laws that apply to the hunting seasons, and therefore the amount of deer that can be taken in the general area, we have a handle exactly on what's coming out and what's, what's left there. What I'm getting at is as far as the zone, I mean the, the uh, permit system is concerned, they might issue 1,500 permits in zone one, which means that they know that out of those 1,500 permits, a certain amount of dough may be taken, and they could keep it within what they're prescribed uh, model might be. In Worcester County, let's say zone four, uh, I'm sorry, zone six, there may be a less reaction and therefore more protection needed, so they would only offer 400 permits. And <coughs> across the entire uh, zone system, they may offer something like 11,500 permits for everybody there to use. So Steve Williams is our dear biologist in uh, he came to us from Pennsylvania, well recommended, and probably one of the top uh, deer management people in, in the business. I wouldn't want him to know that because uh, we want to keep him sharp. Uh, he brought along his own computer system, and he has applied all of this information into computer files. So he can just about pick out almost anything that you want to do about, about deer. One thing I should also mention is that deer, of course, have antlers. You might hear me say a spike horn buck. I really mean an antler. Now, what, what is an antler besides the, the difference between an antler and a horn? Anybody know? Antlers yeah, grow yearly. Pardon me? Antlers yeah, grow yearly and horns are like, they stay forever. Yeah, horns are permanent. Antlers are dropped every year, replaced every year. So the antler itself is an indicator of the deer's health conditions. Now, what is one of the fawn is first born, it only has three premolars. It's born with milk teeth up front. So when a, a person of our, one of our people working at deer check station, and the hunters are asked to bring the deer in, they have to be recorded, they have to be checked, they have to be tagged, we put a metal tag on the carcass. And from all this information, we gather what's called a profile. And you add to that profile every year. You know where it came from, you know the sex, you also know the age. Now, looking at the fawns, when fawns are born over a three months period of time, the milk teeth are replaced when they're about six months old. So if you look at a, a small deer and look at the front teeth, you can tell immediately if they still have the milk teeth, it's five months or less. When those teeth are pushed out by the teeth behind them, the front incisors come in in a straight manner this way. So in that process of replacement, we call them six months old. At seven months, those teeth are in and in place and turn. And the front incisors on the bottom are, are this way. They're used for nipping on butts. Now, a deer is required by nutrition. I think it's two pounds, four pounds of, of uh, superior brows for each 100 pounds of body weight. A 100 pound deer is required four pounds of superior brows to survive. Now, superior brows might be twigs, the branches, the, the choice morsels that they might have. If they get into hay and, and some of these things, then it's going to be increased about the number of, of fodder, fodder they must have to, to uh, maintain their body weight. Getting back to the aging process of deer, that same fawn, one year from now, we can tell exactly its age by a one year five, one year six, or one year seven. The first three premolars that the fawn had, the third one has a three-pointed cusp to it. As it starts to uh, develop more teeth, this third molar will show at a year five, well worn down and just about ready to be replaced. At a year six, that tooth is gone and new white teeth are coming in behind it. At a year seven, it has those teeth all in place. So we can exactly identify the first age class, five, six, or seven months, 
and one year later, those same age class of deer. Beyond that, it's lumped into the half-year system because we have the hunting in the fall of the year, the deer are born in the spring. So now they're considered two and a half. At the age of two and a half, all the teeth that they're going to have for all the rest of their life are there and in place. There's a, there's a, there's a cusp in the way in the back that is now through. The one on the top is pointing through, and it shows a little bit of wear on the first molar. From then on, it's, a, it's the aging process of wearing down uh, on the outside as well as the inside, and you can follow the age back to about 10 years. Now the bulk of your animals that you see at a check station are going to be the younger deer. The prime age of a deer is probably in the three and a half to four and a half and five and a half year class. You see these deer in the film here supporting massive racks. You know these are older animals. The antler development depends on the nutrition that they find on conditions in the spring of the year. Along about now, they start to grow as a nub, which would be all covered with the uh, but it looks like moss, and the, this development takes place through the summer. And if they find good nutrition, they'll have good antler development. So we expect by the time the fall comes around, the, uh, the velvet on the outside, which is a blood supply system that makes that whole process grow, uh, dries up and they rub it off on these bushes and so forth and polish up the antlers. And they're only used during the mating season for any particular noticeable use outside of uh, looks, of course. And along about December, they start to, to replace these again. So when you see a spike horn on a check station, usually in Massachusetts, that animal will rip probably 105 to 110 pounds. It'll have uh, roughly about 11 millimeters in diameter, the size of the, of the thickness of the spike and probably six to seven inches in length. Now that same deer in the year and a half class could also be a two-pointer or a four-pointer, depending on, uh, again, on, on nutrition, but it will still have the same relatively small antler beam diameter. At two and a half, you're looking at an animal that might have 18, 19, or 20 millimeters in diameter to give you an idea of what might happen the second year. In the third year, when you're getting the, the prime deer, you'll see these antler beams up to 33, 34, 35 millimeters. So it's only an indicator. If an older deer uh, has had poor conditions, let's say he's 10 years old, he's on his way out, perhaps he's gonna, gonna die or so, starvation over the next winter, he may have spikes or smaller in, in the last year or so of his life, again, depending on nutrition. Now, the white-tailed deer in the wild does not get much over 10 years. In captivity, they've been able to feed him a chopped uh, vegetation to save on his tooth wear and might get him the last 16 years, but that's artificial. Uh, also in the film, you saw other forms of wildlife that perhaps weren't here too many years ago. The turkey vulture is moving in on its own. The, the possum is another one that's extending its range. Uh, we now have turkeys in the, in the wild that we haven't had here for some 200 years. We have a, a restoration program that started back in the early 70s with a wild turkey. Uh, we sent biologists to New York State and they trapped, I think it was uh, 37 wild birds from a latitude like we have. Uh, they were brought over here and released and that became the nucleus of the present day turkey flock that we have. Previous to that, we had available to us some birds from West Virginia. And these were half pen raised birds. That means that the, one of the parents was a wild bird, came in and serviced some, some game farm hens, and then those offspring were brought up here and tried to be released as wild birds. And they really didn't make it because they moved in on farms and became dependent on people for their food and they weren't the real wild strain. So the success of the turkey project wasn't until the New York State live trap birds were brought over here. Today we have something like uh, seven or eight or nine thousand uh, of these birds across the state. You'll notice in the regulations for turkeys there's a special season. It's in the first three weeks of May divided in two halves. 
first half being one week, the second half being the next two weeks. And I believe it's Route 30, 31, through, down through Spencer, from Pittsburgh, down through Spencer, down through uh, Dudley, is the dividing line. To the west of that line is a turkey uh, uh, hunting area, and to the east of that is still closed. Jim Cardoza is our turkey biologist. He's been with us for some time. And about every two years, they may change <coughs> excuse me, the, uh, that line a little bit to, uh, to increase uh, the amount of areas that where turkeys can be hunted. What we've been doing over the last uh, well, six or eight years, in the wintertime when you've got a, a good uh, snow cover on the ground and we find turkeys moving into some of these farms, we'll set up a baiting station and we get turkeys coming to a, a corn bait. And uh, it's quite unique. They're pretty sharp as far as uh, surviving in the wild. But they'll come in on the farm and they'll find some place to feed, maybe around a manure pile or one of these kind of places. And we set up this bait system in a close proximity to, to that. Once the birds readily come to the bait, <coughs> we keep it baited every couple of days. Then we pick a day, we're going to go out and actually uh, do a cannon netting trap. We set up a, a box. It looks like a trapezoid or something like this. It's about this wide and it may be that deep, about this high, painted white to look like the snow, and set that within about 35 feet of this bait station. The idea being that turkeys will accept that box being there for about a week or 10 days, uh, however long it takes us to decide that the turkeys are coming in on a regular basis. Then get up there early the next morning when we decide to make the shoot. And substitute that box for the real one that holds a cannon net. Now a cannon net is 60 by 40 foot in length. It has weights attached to one side of it, two pound weights. And on the other side of it, uh, we set up a rocket system. On the top of this box, there's three angle irons, and each of those contains a rocket that's charged uh, with black powder. And it's designed for this rocket, when, it, when you touch it off, it goes out in such a manner that it drops on the bait site. We set it up with a six volt battery and run a wire back to one of the farm buildings or a truck or someplace a couple hundred feet away so you can sit back and wait for the birds to come in. Once they do come down, you watch the birds start feeding and you make sure all the heads are down because uh, that gives you about a second advantage. When the heads are down, they don't know what's happening. They have to look up and see what's happening, and then the reaction time uh, is in your favor. When you touch off this charge, this net just goes out in an opening motion like this, and it drops on that site. And then you run out and try to hold the net down because these birds are strong and powerful, jumping up in the air, and that net's starting to flop around. And you've got to hold the edges down to keep those birds inside that net. At that point, you start to roll it in from the outside until you get a bird, you grab the bird, put it in a, a, a little box that we designed. Uh, it's a narrow, tall one that a turkey can get into, but it can't turn around. And uh, we'll stuff all these birds into boxes immediately and get them into a place where you've got a uh, shelter to work, maybe the shed or something like that. Each bird is taken out, then you identify whether it's a tom or a hen. And they usually, in the wintertime, uh, travel in flocks that are separate by sex. Hens will be together and toms will be together. Uh, one of the ones, the last one I was with was up in Leiden a couple of years back, and we caught uh, 13 birds in one shot. They all came down to this bait site, and we got them all. It worked out just right. Uh, once you decide the, uh, the sexes, uh, you put the bands on the birds, of course, and then you take a weight, gives you an idea of the age. Now. One turkey might lay a clutch of 18 eggs or so, and they nest on the ground at the base of a tree. And those young poults have that one uh, chance of survival, it's, it's how good the mother is. If you have a cold, wet, rainy spring, the exposure when these birds don't have their full plumage might be the biggest determining factor of the success of a particular hatch. And if those birds can get underneath the mother and get sheltered, they have a good chance of, of coming through. So a lot of times they may start off with 15 or 18 as one brood and end up with six or seven uh, to the mature stage.
the uh, only bird that's legal for hunting is a tom. That's the male bird. Or any bearded bird, let's put it that way. There's probably one out of a couple of hundred females that might have a beard too. Uh, if that were the case, that would be a legal bird to be taken because you have to have a beard that shows. Uh, the jakes, that would be the first year toms, will be uh, having a short little little short beard. And they probably, they probably would weigh between uh, oh, 10, 10, 11 pounds, something like that. We have on record, I think, a 27 pounder with a beard about 10 and a half inches long. Again, the beard is an indicator. It doesn't mean it's, uh, it's the only thing because uh, a lot of times if they're out in around the seeps and so forth this time of year, uh, they could get frozen or brittle or whatever. So it's not a real true indicator. Turkeys require moisture on a daily basis, which means that they're going to have to get to a seep somewhere where there's a spring hole, where there's water available to them. And uh, they can go for periods of time without food, but the water is a more determining factor. And as far as their food is concerned, a turkey will eat just about anything, from poison ivy to insects to whatever. Uh, so they really are a survivor given, given an off chance. Is Sir? What the major predator other than man? It would be in the young stages. It could be something like a coyote, perhaps a fox, and the horned owl being one of the bigger ones at night, getting a brood that's exposed uh, somewhere. So, um, I would say that probably the worst would be weather. The next one might be the horned owl, and then to, a, to another degree, uh, uh, other type of predators. You saw a coyote in the film. Now, in 1936, we had the first coyote identified in Massachusetts. And today, they're across the canal, all the way out on the Cape. A few years ago, we uh, gave the coyote game status, got it on the list of a, as a game species, and now there's a season, a hunting season for coyotes. I think they're taking around 35 or 40 animals a year now, which really isn't enough. Uh, the coyote has been one that's expanded its range all through the northeast, and this eastern coyote that we have is larger than its western cousins. For some reason, in the northeast, it grows quite well. I had one brought into the office this year. Uh, again, they have to be tagged. It weighed out at 67 pounds, which is unusual. They usually go 35 to 40. We, uh, in the process of building a profile, like the coyote being a new animal, the fisher being another one, we require people who take these animals to bring them to the office for tagging purposes of the pelts and to turn in carcasses on certain In that uh, regulations, you'll see those. The reason for that is that, let's say in, a, in the case of the fisher, uh, the fisher is one that they take about 160, 170 animals a year in a 30-day season. Now, these are trapped. They're susceptible to trapping. So it's a real, real short season. Now, the fisher is a, a vicious predator in its own right. And they'll devastate, uh, let's say, the porcupine den or other animals that they the snowshoe hare. They're the one animal that the quills of a porcupine uh, don't seem to affect. They'll flip a porcupine and start f feeding on it from the breast out and leave nothing but a, a skin and some of the quills. If they get quills in the face, they don't seem to bother them at all. We have maintained a goal of about 170 animals to be taken a year to, to, to try to maintain that population, and that's what we're doing right now. When the carcasses come to us, of course, we know where they're coming from, we know the sex, we know the, we know the weight, we know the length, and all these kind of things. They remove a tooth from the animal at the lab, and they cut that, dip it in dye, and take a cross-section, and they can tell the age of that animal from the rings on the, on the tooth. From the stomach contents, they know what it's been feeding on. From its range, by the report where it came from, you know its territory it came from. On the females, they can take and slice the ovary, and they can tell how many young they've had. So this is what I mean by building a profile. Year to year, you keep adding to that. When you have a, a, a population, uh, fisher that runs about uh, 160 brought into us, then you have 160 carcasses to view. 
In the case of the Bobcat, you don't have that many, so you have to, it takes a longer process to build that same profile. Uh, so as I said before, a lot of these things that you do as far as uh, game management is, a lot of it is seat of the pants operation. You have to just go out and start collecting information and then interpret what you have. Anybody have questions while we're, while we're going through here? Sir? Um, the coyotes, um, <coughs> could the size that you said how the, the eastern coyotes are larger than the western, yes. um, could that be a result of just a better better habitat or more food? Um, it might very well be the fact that uh, when they moved in here, they have the territory pretty much to themselves being one of the major predators now in, in a situation where uh, they might have come from a different situation and <coughs> they just develop into a larger animal. They seem to have better, better prime fur. They also seem to have a big variety in the coloration. I've seen uh, uh, coyotes brought in from the same farm. Uh, sometimes the farmer would have a cow that dies in the wintertime. You can't dig a hole, they take it out back and leave it there. Coyotes start feeding on it. Uh, I know of one farmer who shot three coyotes off this carcass in the course of the winter's time. Brought them in for, for uh, to, be, to be checked and tagged. And each had a different color face. From a reddish color like a fox to a dark color like a German shepherd. But there are things about that carcass that's going to be uniformed on all of them. Narrow muzzle, pointed ears. Across the withers, there'll be a, a black mark of some sort on the rump and on the tail. The tail is 14 inches long, very, very bushy and always held low. When they move, you can't mistake them because they, they don't move like a dog, first of all. I've seen them as, as almost a blonde to as black as a, a, a Labrador Retriever. And you get the, in, you know, in between. They are an unusual animal, and they're a survivor. <clears throat> and I think that one of the things that's going to have to happen in order to try to control that population might be uh, such things as extending the season that they're allowed to be taken. Uh, right now, they're not taken during deer season. Another thing might be the fact that people who like to hunt should develop a system that will work for coyotes consistently. Years ago, when the foxes were prevalent, a lot of people had foxhounds, and they developed a system of hunting with dogs. I think the coyote might be one that you could hunt with dogs, but nobody has taken the time to put together and train and develop a pack of animals that'll take the coyote and uh, to a successful uh, hunting. What's now is hit or miss, unless you get into a place where you have problems. While we're talking about coyotes, uh, interesting enough, we tried at one time to trap some coyotes. Now again, we're using University of Mass people. They had some traps that were designed to hold bobcats. And this is a, a trap with a noose affair. Two spikes go in the ground, arm the trigger bar, and you lay out this noose right over the treadle. And this is designed so when it goes off, the arm kicks up and actually springs that noose on the, on the animal's foot. We had a complaint from the town of Berniston, chief of police and his dog officer, that they had a, a coyote that killed a hog, the guy has a, has a pig farm. And supposedly, I didn't see it happen, but two coyotes took this 125-pound hog and skidded it over an eight-foot gravel bank in Bankman, and then fed on it over there the next over the next uh, day or two. Now they sat on that carcass, trying to destroy those coyotes that came down to it, and they'd stay out till one o'clock in the morning, and they'd come back at the next morning, and the carcass had been fed on. And I said to the chief, I said, "Sure, chief," I says. That coyote's smarter than you are. He just waited for you fools to go home, and then he could go out and feed, see? So they wanted to trust to try to, to remove these animals, and it was a good opportunity for us to try something. I didn't think it was gonna work, but we could give it a shot anyway. 